some example, what we see first we see the density of the tissue and the mammography film and we see the cal we can see the calcification in the mammography density what is density density of the why we detect the density in density of the normal breast tissue is always less compared to the malignant or the neoplastic lesion benign or the malignant neo lesions so we have to see the uh, density of the breast tissue density of the normal adipose tissue is uh, obviously less because it's a fatty tissue and the in the tumor masses like either the benign or the malignant tumor masses there is a, some fibrosis is there so fibrosis make the tissue more very dense so we can detect the density density is increase in the case of the carcinomas fibroadenoma or any cyst but in in situ carcinoma we really see the density density is very uh, mild differ in the in situ carcinoma compared to the normal breast tissue so it's difficult to detect the in situ carcinoma on the basis of their density second important finding in the mammography is calcification calcifications are mainly associated with the uh, whatever the necrotic debris are formed by the lesion and the present in the cyst or some hyaluronized stroma some secretory material they calcified in the ducts or in the cyst or in the masses and we can detect this calcification either as a small calcification or irregular or some small clusters or linear or in the form of the branches we can detect the calcification in ductal carcinoma in situ uh, the most common feature is calcification so by on the calcification we can diagnose the ductal carcinoma in situ not on the basis of the density only in case of the invasive carcinoma calcifications are quite small and rarely associated uh, with the uh, lymph node metastasis in the benign the condition the calcifications are mainly in the form of the clusters um, of apocrine cyst uh, sometimes we can detect the this uh, in the fibroadenomas or in the sclerosing adenosis we can detect the calcifications so if the irregular calcification is present so uh, or if there is a small some clusters or linear branching calcifications present so we have to suspect for the malignancy first so it's very important the mammography is very important now comes to the inflammatory lesions of the breast first we uh, discuss fat necrosis so fat necrosis is also known as fatty lump uh, in every, each and every category we will define the each and every lesion so first here the what is the definition of fat necrosis here the normal fat cells of the breast become round lump through necrosis uh they can simulate the carcinoma uh, clinically and on the mammographically why clinically because they have they are the painful round lump present in the breast and there is a necrosis is there so patient is present with the uh, some irregular mass in the breast so it's very important on uh, this is also associated with the clinical features are painful lumps in duration may be present with irregular counter and also this necrotic fat lumps are associated with the retraction of skin that's why they simulate uh, clinically as a carcinoma why on mammographically because in this uh, breast fat necrosis the calcification may be present and calcification appear as a maybe the uh, look like a carcinomatous mass what are the causes of the uh, this fat necrosis first any trauma prior surgical intervention or exposure of radiation these factors can lead to fat necrosis in breast okay in mammography uh, the calcification is appear like a egg shell calcification and this egg shell calcification typical appearance like a egg shell is also seen in the carcinoma that's why on the mammography they appear like a malignant lesion what is the gross finding when the gross uh, specimen comes to the histopathology department it look like a necrotic fat tissue nothing else but the fatty tissue yellowish and the with a necrosis black necrotic material so uh, it's very important to rule out the cancers histologically microscopically what we get in the slide there is a necrotic fatty tissue with areas of calcification along with infiltration of inflammatory cells like neutrophil lymphocytes pcs plasma cells um, with the histiocytes with fomicytoplasm 
they are the lipid laden macrophages lipid is present inside the macrophages they appear like a foamy histiocytes we get the foreign body type of the giant cells and the granulation tissue granulation tissue is nothing else but just the inflammatory tissue along with the capillary proliferation so we get the capillary proliferation also along with this inflammation so it's known as granulation tissue okay uh, sometimes they uh, this uh, lumps uh, show the cystic areas lipid field cysts are there along with the surrounding fibrosis whenever there is inflammation fibrosis must be there so there is inflammation along with the fibrosis necrotic material necrotic debris and calcification these all these findings we get in the fat necrosis it is a very painful condition as i told you the painful uh, condition and there is a redness in duration is there redness is there irregular lump okay but there is no malignant potential in this cases so we have to be differentiate this from the carcinoma okay dd here is a cancer because i told you like a calcification is there skin retraction is there with induration and irregular contour they so uh, dd here is a cancer treatment is not necessary it will resolve by own also if a uh, symptomatic treatment is required in these cases second category is acute mastitis Uh, but the uh, name itself is acute condition and it's inflammation of the breast tissue it's a skin infection of breast commonly seen in the uh, lactating women and it's most commonly in almost all cases acute mastitis occur during lactation in the 95 90 to 95% of the cases okay mainly occur in the first month of lactation okay why this uh, occur in the initial stage of lactation because in the initial stage there is uh, during the lactation there is a increased stress on the skin surface and a uh, increased stress on the skin or cracks on the skin allow the bacteria which are all normally present on the skin surface like staph aureus enter into the breast okay in the early cases there is a during the developmental stage second and third week of the lactation the bacteria enter into the uh, skin surface because of this uh, all uh, uh, cracks and the fissure whatever present on the nipple surface and this leads to invasion of the this uh, organism mainly staph aureus sometimes streptococcus into the uh, breast tissue so uh, what are the clinical features in this case patient presented with a purulent discharge from the breast or from nipple along with the, the surface is become warm some tenderness is there breast become erythematous enlargement of breast you can see engorgement is there and the loss of nipple integrity may be present in these cases so uh, it's very important to diagnose in the early stage on the cross uh, we can see the abscess uh, forming a mass microscopically uh, we detect the stasis of milk in the distended ducts along with the abscess formation what you get in the abscess formation in the abscess means collection of the inflammatory cells along with the granulation tissue main in mainly the inflammatory cells and the neutrophils okay and the foamy macrophages are present in these cases treatment is antibiotic therapy along with the incision and, and drainage if the abscess is large we have to incise this abscess and drain it now comes to the next category granulomatous mastitis granulomatous mastitis sometimes uh, um, is uh, etiology unknown uh, maybe it's associated uh, simulate the malignant condition we have to be differentiate from the carcinomas what are the different etiology in these cases first is the idiopathic unknown etiology maybe due to hypersensitivity reaction to the luminal secretion of breast epithelium second if uh, some silicon uh, silicon breast implants are present they can lead to granulomatous mastitis because silicon acts as a foreign body and foreign bodies uh, can produce a granulomatous inflammation next uh, systemic non infection co- infectious condition like sarcoidosis vaginal granulomatosis can lead to granulomatous mastitis last most common cause in the india is uh, infections is this is, is tuberculosis can lead to this granulomatous mastitis clinically patient presented with slow growing mass which is solitary and mainly painless mass 
स्लो ग्रोइंग सॉलिटरी पेनलेस मार्क्स इज अ क्लिनिकल फाइंडिंग ऑन एस्ट्रोलॉजिकली माइक्रोस्कोपिकली वॉट वी गेट इन दिस पेशेंट्स वी गेट केजीटिंग टोबर्कल विद डिस्चार्जिंग साइनसिस इन द ब्रेस्ट दिस इज कॉमन इन द डेवलपिंग रीजन एंड दिस इज द सीरियस कंडीशन यू हैव टू बी डायग्नोज इन द अर्ली स्टेज so uh, this is a granulomatous mastitis we get the typical of the granulomas along with the inflammation next uh, important condition is mammary duct ectasia also known as duct ectasia of breast or plasma cell mastitis what is the definition of this uh, mammary duct ectasia this defines a large duct of breast are dilated and filled with secretions and the clot the duct ectasia what do you mean by ectasia ectasia means a dilatation ductal dilatation is a duct ectasia ductal dilatation and these dilated ducts are filled with the secretion which secretions are clot make a clog over there inflammation uh, of the ducts leads to ductal dilatation this ductal dilatation inflammation in the dilated ducts produces debris these debris are piled up and goes into the nipple and they produce a nipple discharge okay what is epidemiology in this case is they mainly affect the 40s to 70 years of age of to uh, mainly the post menopausal women and multi parous women and this is a rare condition what we get uh, the clinical history patient presented with a complaint of green or brown intermittent nipple discharge this is a typical uh, clinical history if green and brown or brown color discharge is present with intermittent discharge is present the most common cause is this mammary duct ectasia okay mammographically uh, typical rod like calcification is present inside the dilated ducts See this uh, secretion in the dilated duct become a calcified, and we can detect this linear calcification, rod-like calcification in mammogram. Histologically, patient uh, uh, shows the uh, uh, breast tissue sh- uh, shows chronic inflammatory cells along with the plasma cell infiltration. This plasma cell infiltration is uh, important. That's why it's also known as plasma cell mastitis. in this diagram you can see there is a ductal ectasia uh, chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation surrounded by the fibrosis fibrous tissue and the chronic inflammatory cell infiltrates around the this dilated duct centrally you can see the dilated ducts surrounded by the inflammatory cells and the fibrous tissue okay this is a case of the duct ectasia in this uh, next picture you can easily see the dilated duct filled with the secretion and secretion become make, make a clog over there and this produce a uh, chronic inflammation or the infiltration of the plasma cells so this is a case of the duct ectasia okay now comes to the next category periductal mastitis what is periductal mastitis mastitis the inflammation of the breast tissue beneath the nipple okay and 90% of the cases cause of periductal mastitis is smoking cigarette smoking is most common cause why uh, there is in this patient who uh, either the male or female this pathology can occur in the male patients also male breast also so uh, smokers presented with the vitamin a deficiency and this vitamin a deficiency leads to inability to maintain specialized epithelium at subareolar ductal entrance leads to excess production of squamous epithelium in the duct and this squamous epithelium enter into the ductal tissue and uh, in the ducts which are present just beneath the nipple and they secrete the keratin material and then duct get clogged they blocked by this squamous epithelium and by the keratin material this blockage leads to inflammation behind the plug along with uh, including fibroblastic activity so there is inflammation there is fibroblastic activity this leads to periduct this is known as everything produce periductal mastitis clear so most common cause is smoking and smoking leads to vitamin a deficiency and vitamin e deficiency leads to 
they affect the integrity of the squamous epithelial cell and squamous epithelial cells uh, enter into the uh, via the nipple and into the duct and they proliferate over there and they produce a keratin secretion and keratin leads to pl plugging of this blockage of the ducts and produce inflammation behind this plug. So epidemiology is clear is the smokers 90% cases the etiology is smokers. Clinically patient presented with the sub mass along with the nipple detraction. Nipple detraction is because of this excessive fibroblastic activity along with the inflammation. Clear? Now comes to the next important category fibrocystic changes. Uh, fibrocystic changes previously uh, it's also known as the fibrocystic disease also known as the fibrocystic breast or fibrocystic breast disease or fibrocystic breast condition FBC nowadays it's used as a term commonly used as a fibrocystic breast condition or fibrocystic changes what is the definition is the appearance of the cyst and fibrous tissue in the breast okay when you get the multiple cystic areas along with the excessive fibrosis, we define as a uh, fibrocystic changes. What is the epidemiology here? Uh, means uh, what are the age group mainly affected? Here the premenopausal age group is mainly affected. Uh, 30 to 55 year of age. Okay, this is a uh, sorry here the mistake. It's a common condition. Com uh, overall, it's a very common condition. In the premenopausal women. Clinical uh, presentation is a painful bilateral breast mass. They are the not well defined masses. They may be the diffuse. The painful condition mainly pain associated with the uh, menstrual cycle. And most common site is uh, this uh, upper outer quadrant. Pain is often cyclic with hormone. What do you mean by cyclic with hormone? Means associated with the menstrual cycle. Whenever it's a hormonal changes during a menstrual cycle, uh, there is a this leads to pain and uh, lumpy feeling in the breast. Okay. Uh, this uh, uh, what we get in this slide uh, in the gross specimen. There's a fibrous tissue along with the blue dome cyst. What do you mean by blue dome cyst? Let's see in the next diagram you can easily see blue dome cyst. First, uh, what you get in the gross cyst of varying size surrounded by uh, dense fibrous tissue. So, dense fibrous tissue surrounds the variable size cyst, and cyst secretes some bluish material, that's why known as blue dome cyst. Histologically, we divide into the two categories non proliferative and the proliferative changes. Okay, what you get in the microscopy uh, in this fibrocystic changes in general the cystic dilatation of the ducts along with the apocrine metaplasia. Apocrine metaplasia may be present or absent. If apocrine metaplasia is absent, you can't rule out the condition, so it's either present or absent interlobular and the intralobular fibrosis and intraductal epithelial proliferation okay so first we'll discuss the fibrocystic changes of uh, non-proliferative type okay fibrocystic changes non-proliferative type what you get in the fibro this non-proliferative type you get everything except the epithelial cell hyperplasia cyst formation with dilatation of the ducts is there okay second thing apocrine metaplasia what in apocrine metaplasia the pink cells with the benign nucleus also you get the fibrosis and the calcification here in this previously i told you the blue dome cyst what is blue dome cyst here you can see that there is a multiple cyst surrounded by the fibrous tissue and there is a bluish secretion in this cyst this is known as blue dome cyst white tissue represents stromal fibrosis the multiple cyst present which is shown by this arrow you can see in this uh, uh, diagram there's a multiple cystic areas with irregular mass and this painful cyclical pain is there so this is a uh, typical gross picture of the fibrocystic changes what you get in the microscopy you get the multiple cyst 
and sometime you get the calcification this arrow shows the calcification you can see there is a black uh, bluish black dot this is the calcification so uh, background fibrous stroma is there here uh, you can see here the multiple cyst few are small few are large and few cysts are filled with the uh, secretions and here you can see the one cyst is filled with the calcified material clear so uh, cyst formation calcification along with the uh, uh, sometimes you get the epithelial hyperplasia but this is the type of the non proliferative type so you never get the epithelial hyperplasia next feature is apocrine metaplasia what is apocrine metaplasia you can see in this uh, picture clearly there is a multiple uh, you can see the epithelial lining uh, with pink cytoplasm and the benign nucleus in the cells you can easily appreciate this so this if you get this type of the cells with the pink abundant pink cytoplasm and the benign appearing nucleus this is known as apocrine metaplasia okay so uh, this is a uh, picture i uh, taken from the harsh mohan book so you can see first is a line diagram and second is the original histopathology diagram this you can see here first uh, this uh, uh, there is a dilated duct dilated duct filled with the uh, secretions and then surrounded by the fibrous tissue then uh, you can see the adenosis adenosis with the proliferation of the mammary glands the next is the epithelial hyperplasia when when we say epithelial hyperplasia when the ductal lining is more than two layers so there is just the two layer thickening and this is apocrine metaplasia the last multiple cells with the abundant cytoplasm and pink cytoplasm and benign appearing nucleus you can see benign appearing nucleus has important those all the ducts are lined by the double layer my epithelial cells and there is the epithelial cell lining so this is a dilated cyst here then apocrine metaplasia here is apocrine metaplasia and you can see the multiple proliferation of the gland is the adenosis in the original diagram and surrounded by the whole the fibrous fibrous tissue okay so this is a uh, case of the fibrocystic changes if you get all this picture in the slide then only you can say it's a case of the fibrocystic changes if the excessive epithelial hyperplasia is present then is a proliferative type and there is if there is no epithelial hyperplasia then it's non proliferative type of the uh, fibrocystic changes what you get in this uh, mammography you can see there is a mammography if the mammographic slide uh, there is a multiple uh, increased density localized uh, irregular mass increased density and sometimes the small small dots you can see here it's a calcification and there's a gross picture you can see here the blue dome cyst as i told you this they are the blue dome cyst with the white fibrous tissue and the cyst are filled with a bluish secretion and here you can see the apocrine metaplasia along with the cystic changes and the lumen is filled with the debris and the calcified material so a typical picture of the fibrocystic change now uh, we already we discussed the fibrocystic change non proliferative type now comes to the proliferative breast changes fibrocystic changes with proliferation proliferation here i told you if epithelial hyperplasia is present then we say is a proliferative type of the breast changes what do you mean by epithelial hyperplasia if the epithelial lining is more than two layers normally two layers are present my epithelial cells and epithelial cell lining is more than two layers or three layers is present we say is mild type if uh, four five layers is present then we is a moderate type if the epithelial layers uh, completely uh, fill the duct ductal lumen we say is this florid or the severe type of the epithelial hyperplasia this epithelial hyperplasia may be associated with the uh, atp or maybe associated with without any atp so it's important to us to see the atp is present or absent okay so atp is very important feature if the atp is present we say uh, known as it um, epithelial uh, atypical epithelial hyperplasia is atp is absent we know as epithelial hyperplasia simple epithelial hyperplasia or epithelial hyperplasia of usual type okay next category on next what we get in this uh, proliferative breast changes sclerosing metaplasia or sclerosing adenosis the third is multiple intraductal papilloma or uh, can also be the features of proliferative breast changes we'll discuss in detail all these features 
in the next slides uh they have they haven't any malignant potential usually no malignant potential treatment is ocp to manage symptoms that is i already told you it's a hormonal uh, changes which leads to pain proliferation of the epithelial cells cystic formation excessive secretion dilatation of the ducts cystic changes debris calcification all is because everything is because of the hormonal changes in the breast so nothing to do just uh, uh ocps are uh, sufficient for to treat the patient next uh, here the in this category let's uh, elaborate everything first is the epithelial hyperplasia of usual type here we are discussing proliferative breast changes okay fibrocystic changes we divide into non proliferative type and proliferative type here we are discussing proliferative type of the fibrocystic changes in this category first is epithelial hyperplasia of usual type means epithelial type hyperplasia without any atp there is no atp there here what you get the ductal lumens are almost completely filled with proliferating epithelium you here is you can see this these are the ducts and ducts are lined by the basement membrane near the myoepithelial cells at the corner the flatted flat cells are the myoepithelial cell in the near the basement membrane and the central lumen is filled with the epithelial cells what is uh, this uh, we can get here the, all the nucleus are of equal size there is no nuclear atp and uh, some uh, fenestration are there so cribriform appearance is there in this case so this is a case of the epithelial hyperplasia of usual type no atp just proliferation of the epithelial cells okay this next category is uh, after the epithelial hyperplasia of usual type next category is sclerosing adenosis the term itself uh, define this condition here this uh, the involved terminal duct lobular unit is enlarged this is a single terminal duct lobular unit which is enlarged compared to the normal breast tissue if we compare the normal lobular unit which is very small i had already will to see uh, in the normal anatomy and here you can see the excessive proliferation of the terminal duct lobular unit it's enlarged proliferation of the sni and this sni are the compressed and distorted by the dense stroma calcification are present within the sum of the lumen unlike a uh, carcinoma the sni are arranged in swirling pattern okay and the outer border is well circumscribed you can see here this is a uh, picture of sclerosing adenosis this is sclerosing adenosis term itself the sclerosis and adenosis is the adenosis means the proliferation of these sni you can see the multiple sni few of sni are the field with the secretion few are field with the brown dark uh, calcified material and they surrounded by the dense stroma which compressing these all the sni few are the completely compressed few are showing the cystic areas and the distortion of the whole sni the sni is arranged in swirling pattern okay and you can see there is a, there is no invasion outside the this terminal duct lobular unit everything is limited by this fibrous tissue so this is the case of sclerosing adenosis so we have to differentiate it from the carcinoma because there is excessive proliferation of the sni can simulate um, histologically as a carcinoma or calcification is also there excessive fibrosis is also there so you have to be differentiated how we differentiate first they limited to the one lobular terminal duct lobular unit other terminal duct lobular unit near by it may be normal or smaller in size so we have to be compare with the surrounding tissue so this is the second uh, type of the proliferative fibrocystic changes okay next is radial sclerosing lesion this is again uh, look like a carcinoma so we have to be very careful during the diagnosis of this radial sclerosing lesion it's appear like a stellate like a star so uh, in the mammography also there is mass consist of the central nidus of small tubule entrapped in a dense fibrocystic stroma and numerous projections containing epithelium with varying degree of cyst formation and hyperplasia so you can see here this uh, there is a proliferation of the ducts they forming the central nidus and then stellate like a star like projection they radiate uh, in the surrounding tissue it look like a invasion in the normal breast tissue 
okay and they are surrounded by the dense fibrous stroma various numerous projections the numerous projection containing epithelium of uh, varying degree some uh, at places you can see these are the cystic changes cystic areas are there here there is a proliferation of the epithelium proliferation of the acini adenosis is there okay and there is a thick fibrous tissue and this fibrous tissue is en enter into the surrounding fatty tissue uh, okay so it look like an invasion so it's very important to differentiate it from the uh, malignant breast how you differentiate we have to stain for the myoepithelial cells and epithelial cells if myoepithelial cells are present then this is a benign condition and the, all the basement membrane of this acini are intact in the mammography you can see there is a central nidus uh, with the increased density and sometimes calcification can be present and this is the second is a gross picture this uh, uh, look like a malignant lesion because of this dense fibrous stroma now comes to the next condition intraductal papilloma a most common cause of bloody nipple discharge whenever patient comes to you with a bloody nipple discharge first diagnosis is a intraductal papilloma and second is a carcinoma so you have to be differentiate clinically or by other means so patient presented with the nipple discharge no any pain and small lump is present okay because it's the papilloma is inside the duct so lump is very small or maybe non detectable so the complaint is small, uh, bloody nipple discharge histologically what we get we get the dilated duct and this dilated duct is filled with the um, this papilloma a central fibrovascular core extended from the wall of duct okay the papillae arborize within the lumen and lined by myoepithelial and luminal epithelial cells this is the finding so you can see here in this diagram this is the dilated duct uh, is there my epithelial lined by my epithelial cells and then the central area you can see there is a in the right left side there is a fibrovascular core okay here is the fibrovascular core and these are the papilla the papilla this fibrovascular core extends to the papilla and the proliferation of the epithelial cells in the papillary pattern so this is a case of the intraductal papilloma here is another picture of this uh, uh, fibro intraductal papilloma forms with the uh, fibrovascular core surrounded by epithelial cells and myoepithelial cells in the lactiferous ducts or in a cystic looking space so there is a cyst like space in which there is a proliferation of the epithelial cells and the myoepithelial cells and then central fibrovascular core is there there is a pink area is a fibrovascular tissue fibrovascular core and they lined by the myoepithelial and the epithelial cells if the myoepithelial cells are not there then may be the malignant but we can see the elongated elongated myoepithelial cell along with the epithelial cells so this is the case of the benign intraductal papilloma clear this is uh, very nice picture now comes to the next category of this proliferative breast changes a typical ductal hyperplasia here can differentiate from the uh, easily differentiate from the epithelial hyperplasia of usual type see uh, let's go to the previous slides so can easily differentiate from this uh, this here you can see epithelial hyperplasia of usual type all the nucleus are benign fire picture is similar to the atypical hyperplasia but what we have to see nucleus the size of the nucleus is same in this case the category okay this is the epithelial hyperplasia of usual type now comes to the atypical epithelial hyperplasia here the ducts are filled with a markedly atypical cell sorry markedly atypical cell here you can see there is a nuclear pleomorphism increased mitotic activity what is increased mitotic activity how can we detect the abnormal mitosis like the elongated nucleus in the central of the lumen you can see the elongated nucleus there are the increased abnormal mitotic figures here you can see in the lower ducts in the center there is a dark dark uh, cells which are elongated irregular in shape they are the uh, abnormal mitotic activity and there you can easily appreciate the atp in this cells clear atypical atypical cells pleomorphism is there 
destruction of the cell in the center of the lumen and the uh, ductal epithelial cells uh, completely obliterate the lumen of ducts so the ducts are filled with markedly atypical cells so this is a case of atypical ductal hyperplasia so it's very easy if you compare the both the slides you can easily appreciate this is atypical hyperplasia and that one is a epithelial hyperplasia proliferative breast disease and the risk of the cancer this is very important uh, the non proliferative breast fibrocystic breast ch changes is completely uh, this not that one is not associated with the uh, malignant potential there is no malignant potential in the non proliferative fibrocystic changes but fib proliferative type of the fibrocystic changes are associated with some uh, associated with the uh breast cancers atypical epithelial hyperplasia increases the risk by 4 to 5 times so important epithelial hyperplasia of usual type increases the risk by 1.5 to 2 times it's very important if positive family history is present then doubles the this risk means if the positive family history is present patient have the history of the siblings positive family history of the breast carcinoma and she has epithelial uh, hyperplasia of usual type then chances of the cancer in that patient is around 3 to 4 percent and if there is a positive family history and atypical epithelial hyperplasia is present then chances of uh, cancer in this patient is 8 to 10 percent so it's very important to take the family history now next category is male breast gynecomastia Well, uh, this is a enlargement of br male breast uh, causes relative estrogen excess is a cause of this uh, gynecomastia excessive estrogen excess we uh, occur in at the time of puberty maybe occur at the old age uh, associated with the cirrhosis and if the patient have any estrogen secreting patient has any estrogen secreting tumors okay carcinoma chances of carcinoma in gynecomastia is very rare less than 1% of breast cancer occur in men it's strongly associated with the brca2 other pathology in male breast is very very rare okay uh, this is a picture of the gynecomastia uh, the there is absence of lobule this you can see there is no lobule here there is a dilated duct surrounded by the loose stroma and then followed by the dense stroma it's very important they lined by the double layer my epithelial cells and epithelial cell lining there is no pro epithelial proliferation nothing else important is the dilated duct with uh, absence of the lobule so this is a picture of the gynecomastia that's all for this lecture thank you so much for your attention